Dobro večer svima. Drago mi je što smo se u ovim vanrednim okolnostima ipak okupili ovde, s obzirom da večeras imamo izvanrednu priliku, odnosno imamo i arhitektonski fakultet, ima izuzetno zadovoljstvo da predstavi jednog veoma značajnog, možda jednog od najznačajnijih gostiju koji je ikad gostao na našem fakultetu, profesor Juhani Palasma sa fakulteta u Helsinkiju i jedan od značajnih arhitekata, mislilaca, teoretičara i filozofa, neko ko je izuzetno cenjen u oblasti arhitekture, naročito u oblasti teorije arhitekture. Stvarno imamo izuzetnu priliku, eto da večeras čujemo njegovo predavanje. Pored ovog predavanja, on drži jedan kratak trodnevni kurs, odnosno jednu kratku trodnevnu radionicu sa studentima doktorskih studija, vezano za opet neka razmišljanja arhitekture i filozofije, ali da ne bi ja dužio, takođe bih teo večeras da pozdravim našu koleginicu Ajlu Selenić, koja već više od 20 godina živi i radi u Helsinkiju i na čiju inicijativu je zapravo profesor Palasma došao ovde kod nas i zapravo ja bih teo pre svega da se zahvatim profesoru Palazmi i da se zahvalim Ajli na njenoj inicijativi koja je zapravo doprinela i dovela do toga da večeras imamo ovako značajno dosta kod nas. Ajlu, izvon. Hvala. Da li me čuli? Dobro večer i hvala svima. Ja ću ovaj uvodni govor pročitati na engleskom, ali vas je svima najlepše. Zahvaljujem što ste došli pored ove teške situacije u zemlji koja nas je sve pogodila. Dear, je li me čuti? Dear colleagues and friends, May I begin with thankfulness to all who came tonight. It's a great honor and joy to welcome such an esteemed guest, Professor Emeritus Juhani Palasma, one of the most distinguished architects and writers on architecture and phenomenology of space, who lectured extensively around the world for more than 40 years on the existential meaning of architecture, visual arts and cultural philosophy. Certainly the most important and incomparable architectural figure in Finland today, former dean and professor of architecture at the School of Architecture, Helsinki University of Technology, tied to the most celebrated architects of Finnish modern architecture, Alvar Aalto, Aulis Blomstedt, his teacher and mentor, Arne Rusuvori, and Reima Pietila, Professor Palasma's dear friend. Uh, while at we, many of us have here studied about their works in this same auditorium, listening to the unforgettable lectures on contemporary architecture uh, of our dear Professor Anko Radovic. Juhani Palasma created the heart of the architectural scene of Helsinki for many decades by his outstanding and profound writings and lectures, uh, by his aura of authority, depth and sensibility, uh, by his archite numerous architectural projects and by creating some of the most memorable exhibitions as the Animal Architecture in 1995. Nowadays involved in the architectural e events of greatest significance today as a jury member for the Pritzker Award Prize. Besides countless international awards and honors, over 47 books and uh, many hundreds of essays that are the indispensable literature of architectural education around the world, I would rather like to emphasize the unique meaning of Juhani Palasma and his philosophy in the world of architecture as a precious and profound observer opening the frames of the perception of space, time and architecture. Perception that is extended not only to the realm of visual but to the, the, to the more profound uh, sensibility to the realm of ineffable where we reach the poetry 
and the same space where architecture, art, science and all fields of creativity meet the most essential question, questions of human existence. Redefining the essential meaning and role of architecture through its intertwining relation with art, philosophy and literature, Juhani Palasma is reminding us that besides all technical knowledge, in order to become and be an architect, it is important to build upon the foundation of immaterial, spiritual values embedded in cultural identity and the sense of belonging, integrity, in emotion, memory, and not to forget the dreams. Tonight we have the privilege to hear only one of his lectures, where, while there is still an abundance of themes and precious thoughts on the existential task of architecture and its limits, which we can find in other books and essays yet to be discovered and read in our country and in our university. Thoughts to bring us towards a vision of future based on sensibility, generosity, and the search for wisdom. Uh, And just to mention that uh, we will have another, the second chance to, to hear another lecture at the Cultural Center of Belgrade on Thursday, 7 o'clock. Well, thank you for the very generous introduction. Um, I, as I have published 48 books and 400 essays, I uh, gave uh, a list of possible subjects to Ayla, and uh, so I'm giving the lectures that she chose. And uh, the one I'm giving uh, tonight is on architectural education, and uh, uh, I'm going to talk, talk about humanist education in, in uh, architectural education because I have been become so worried that uh, architecture turns increasingly into a technocratic profession and for me uh, architecture has to be grounded on uh, existential issues and uh, without being grounded in human life it has very little value and so much of what is being built to the, today around the world has, uh, is rather questionable in terms of human value in my view. I have uh, uh, entitled my, my talk Landscapes of Architectural Education, Architecture, uh, Knowledge and Existential Wisdom. Can you have more light because I... Yeah, I, I, I can't see much here. Yeah, no, this is not fine. Yes. When the poet David Shapiro interviewed John Haydock, the legendary dean of the Cooper Union School of Architecture in New York, a close friend of mine, on uh, and one of the finest and most influential teachers of architecture in the past decades and asked him about his teaching method, John Hayduk answered, I teach osmosistically by osmosis. That's a somewhat uh, surprising answer from a uh, revered teacher of architecture. With this surprising answer, Heyduk reveals the most essential manner of learning, and that is an unconscious, embodied, and existential absorption rather than an intellectual and verbal recording of facts. This immersion is the manner in, uh, in which um, sorry, 
in, in which each one of us learned our mother tongue, for instance. The, the very essence of uh, learning also in any creative field is embedded more in the student's sense of self and his, her image of the world than in information and facts. I always uh, tell my new students around the world I'm not even going to try to teach you what architecture is, I'm going to try to teach you who you are. Because that is the ground for me. The promoters of a professionalist education seem to entirely dismiss this essential mental and existential perspective. This area of learning can appropriately called personal growth. Education and learning in any creative field aims, uh, has to aim at the student's individual and unique self. And the content of education is bound to be more existential than factual, related more with experiences and values than information. I can already, at this point, feel objections to my view of uh, uh, to my view arising in the audience, but I'll continue to explain why I feel this way after having myself taught around the world for more than 40 years, almost 50 years by now. John Hayduck articulates the, his educational method further when he says, I never draw for the student or draw over their work, and I never tell them what to do. I try, in fact, to draw them out. In other words, draw out what's inside them and just hit a certain key point whereby they can, can develop their idea. I share Big John, John's, that's how he was called among his friends, his educational philosophy, and I have even used the same word, osmosis, to describe my teaching approach, based on an unconscious embodied absorption as the central learning process. In uh, meaningful education, we shape and mold ourselves. Uh, sorry. And, um, uh, sorry, we um, mold ourselves, our very personality, character, and self instead of primarily accumulating facts or even skills. This modeling of self takes place predominantly through an unconscious embodied osmosis, or to use the Aristotelian notion, mimesis. Our mimetic skills have recently been valorized by the invention of the mirror neurons, which is, uh, for me, who has now been interested in, in uh, neuroscience for quite some time, uh, perhaps the most uh, promising opening to the artistic world through scientific, neuroscientific uh, discovery. Our mimetic, uh, sorry, these specialized neural ingredients make us unknowingly mimic movements, gestures, and behaviors of others in our environment. Even newly born babies uh, mimic facial gestures uh, 
after one uh, one hour one hour after the verse through embodied simulation we unconsciously mimic even physical events objects and qualities i can personally say sincerely that i learned more from the way my professors walked and occupied space with their bodies than from their words and i'm here not underestimating my professors intellectual capacities and merely stressing the the power and importance of uh, unconscious mimetic embodied learning i learned more being with my mentors and breathing the same air than doing what they told me to do we seem to be especially strongly influenced by the ethical air that we breathe in our youth the essence of learning is the gradual construction of an inner sense of goal responsibility ethical stance and a combined sense of humility and pride in my view exactly this polar attitude is most difficult to acquire paradoxically the essence of learning is unlearning or forgetting the learned facts i was i once had an opportunity of carrying a dinner conversation with the great spanish sculptor eduardo shida during the evening he said in my work i have never had any use for what i have not uh, done earlier this is a stunning confession of vulnerability from one of the finest artists of last century mind you this artist was also a thinker of the caliber that he collaborated with martin heidegger who is often named as the most influential philosopher of the 20th century gaston bachelard another um seminal philosopher also uses exactly the notion unlearning in his uh, uh stunning and humbling advice on what it takes uh to write a single line of verse rainer maria rilke says that verses are um verses arise from experiences but these experiences have to be forgotten this is what he writes and still it is not yet enough to have memories one must be able to forget them when they are many and one must have the great patience to wait until they come again for it is not yet the memories themselves not till they have turned to blood within us to glance and gesture nameless and no longer to be distinguished from ourselves not till then can it happen that in a most rare hour the first word of a verse arises in their midst and goes forth from them why should the making of architecture differ fundamentally from writing a verse simply we humans are complete biological beings and in any creative work we react with our entire existential sense and identity rather than with our isolated intellect 
and we think with our bodies and intestines as much as with our brain cells. Wisdom arises from existential experiences, not mere pieces of information. This hierarch uh, the, the hierarchical scale, information, knowledge, wisdom, is not always understood in pedagogic practices. It stops at information. Ludwig Wittgenstein suggests work in philosophy, uh, work in architecture and philosophy uh, are similar. They are both ways of working on oneself, on one's way of seeing things. And what one expects, and what one expects of them. We have to make ourselves and construct our world before we are capable of building places for other people to dwell, uh, dwell or, um, sorry, I'm sorry, I just don't have enough light here to read my notes, uh, um, for other people to dwell or contemplate, contemplate in. In educating um, creative capacities, information has to turn into knowledge, thank you very much, into knowledge, knowledge into existential understanding and wisdom uh, uh, and understanding into internalized wisdom. And what is wisdom? Isn't wisdom the finest and deepest quality of being human? As T.S. Eliot, one of the great men of St. Louis where I used to teach, writes, where is the life we lost in living where is the wisdom we lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? The poet's lines make me think of the most severe threat to humanistic and cre creative education today, the loss of the book. Books, whether books on poetry, novels, arts or the sciences, develop fundamental narratives of causality and they open up epic views into the continuum of culture and human life. Regardless of the numerous advantages, digital media break narratives, causation and logic into fragmented bits of information. They also strip away inherent human meaning, intimacy, tactility and sensuality of things. It is not information in a book that is of primary value, it is the book itself, the logic of the story and its ethic causality that possesses the highest educational value. Great novels provide the most profound theater of learning about the logic and illogic, the ecstasies and frustrations of life. Literature permits us to view and experience life and its mysteries and dramas through the minds and hearts of some of the finest and most talented individuals of humankind. Through art, we can see with the eye of Piero della Francesca or Vermeer, and we can feel with the heart of Rilke or Eliot. This is the great gift, the great mercy of profound art and poetry. Great architects. Um, lend us 
the sensitivity of their skin to, be, to feel how the world touches us, to use a beautiful notion of Maurice Merleau-Ponty. We can feel the touch of the world and culture through the skin of Louis Paragon or Louis Kahn and experience the mysteries as well as the truths of existence. The complexity of the phenomenon of architecture results from its impure conceptual essence as a field of human endeavor. Architecture is practical and metaphysical, um, is a practical and metaphysical act. It is a utilitarian and uh, poetic, technological and artistic, economic and existential, collective and individual manifestation, all at the same time. I cannot, in fact, think of uh, a human uh, or name a human endeavor or discipline which would have a more complex and essentially more conflicting grounding in the lived reality and human intentionality than architecture. Architecture is a response to existing demands, fears, wishes, and desires at the same time that it creates its own reality and criteria. It unites the past, present, and future. It is both the end and the means. Besides, in its aspiration towards an ideal, authentic architecture always surpasses all conscious, consciously set aims and consequently Architecture is always a gift. How does one possibly teach such an impossible entanglement of requirements and contradictions? The sheer complexity of any architectural task calls for an embodied manner of working and a total introjection. Introjection is a psychoanalytic term referring to the way that the a uh, young child uh, internalizes the world through his or her mouth. Um, yes, the sheer complexity of any architectural task calls for an embodied manner of working and a total introjection of the task. In creative work, the artist and the architect alike are directly engaged with their bodies and existential experiences rather than focusing on an external and objectified problem. A great musician plays himself rather than the instrument and a masterful soccer player plays the entity of himself, the other players and the internalized and embodied field instead of merely kicking the ball. Quote, the player understands where the goal is in a way which is lived rather than known. The mind does not inhabit the playing field, but the field is inhabited by a knowing body, writes Richard Lang when commenting on Merleau-Ponty's views on the skill of playing soccer. The wise architect works, I believe, through his her entire personality instead of manipulating pieces of pre-existing knowledge or verbal rationalizations. An architectural or artistic task is encountered rather than resolved. In fact, in genuine creative work, Knowledge and prior experience has to be forgotten. Joseph Brodsky, the Nobel laureate poet, puts it bluntly in reality, in art, and I would think science, experience 
and the accompanying expertise are the maker's worst enemies. This is where I agree with the poet. But we tend to think that uh, expertise is, is a virtue. No, expertise is a limitation. Note that here the word experience has a different meaning than in the Rilke quote I uh, uh, told you earlier. In creative work, forgetting is as important as remembering. Unknowing as important as knowing. Hazy perceptions as valuable as focused seeing. This is implicit in the aphorism of Goethe by which I began my lecture. The power of poetic logic. I want to say already at this point that because of its impossible task to integrate irreconcilable opposites, the, es the essence of architecture is bound to be mediation and reconciliation rather than expression, not to speak of self-expression. Architecture negotiates between differing categories and oppositions. I also wish to argue that architecture is conceivable in its contradictory task only through understanding it as a poetic manifestation. Poetic imagery is capable of overcoming contradictions of logic through its polyvalent, synthetic, and unconscious imagery. As Alvaro Alto uh, once wrote, in every case of creative work, one must achieve the simultaneous solution of opposites. Nearly every design task involves tens, often hundreds, sometimes thousands of different contradictory elements which are forced into a functional harmony only by man's will. This harmony cannot be achieved by any other means than those of art. End of quote. We could speak of a poetic rationality and logic or a poetic chemistry, to use a notion of Bachelard. I like the word poetic chemistry or even poetic alchemy. In the past years I have written quite a lot about the architecture of painting and cinema, and I have also studied how architectural settings and situations are conveyed in poetry and fiction. Marilyn Chandler's fine book entitled Dwelling in Text is a fine study of architectural imagery in American fiction. She explores, as, uh, as she explains herself, the ways in which writers have appropriated houses as structural, psychological, uh, metaphysical and literary metaphors, constructing complex analogies between house and psyche, house and family structure, house and social environment, house and text. American writers have generally portrayed the structures uh, an individual inhabits, inhabits as bearing a direct relationship or re re resemblance to the structure of his or her psyche and inner life and as constituting a concrete manifestation of specific values, end of quote. No doubt the same is true uh, for literature in any language. Considerable amount has also been written on the architectural essence of music and vice versa. Not to speak of um, direct cross-inspirations between these two arts. The Pythagorean harmonics, in fact the oldest Western scientific tradition, seeks to unite the spiritual essence 
of music and architecture. I can con confess that I was converted to Pythagoreanism in the late 1970s by my professor and mentor, Aulis Blomstedt, who was married with the youngest daughter of Sibelius and had strong connections with the musical world. All art forms explore the existential essence of culture, life, and human consciousness, and all of them are bound to follow similar strategies and aspirations, structures and metaphors. All arts aspire to represent the human condition and the fundamental existential enigma. Besides, all artistic expression is seeped through the human senses, memory, and imagination. All painters, sorry, this is an image of the, the uh, harmonics system that I use, uh, developed by my professor Alice Bumstead, which is uh, based on uh, Pythagorean ideas, which are more than 2,000 years old. All art forms explore the essential essence of culture, life, and human consciousness. And all of them are bound to follow similar strategies and aspirations, structures, and metaphors. All arts aspire to represent the human condition and the fundamental existential enigma. Besides, all artistic expression is seen through the human senses, memory, and imagination. All painters and poets are born phenomenologists, as the Dutch phenomenologist Van den Berg writes. And we can say the same of all other artists, as well as profound architects. Zemir Tseki, a neurobiologist, has made another interesting proposition when he writes, Artists are in some sense neurologists, studying the brain with techniques that are unique to them, but studying, un but studying unknowingly the brain and its organization nevertheless. This view opens up a bottomless well for architectural inspiration and insight through the study of other art forms. Because of its uh, severe logistical complexities and layers of practical requirements, architecture tends to lose sight of its fundamental existential meaning and to turn into pure rationality or mere aesthetics. An encounter with other arts certainly reinforces the architect's sensitivity of the artistic essence of his her art form. The architecture of painting. Speaking of the evolution of modern architecture, Alvaraldo said, but it all began in painting. In 1947, he wrote, abstract forms of art have brought impulses to, uh, the, to the architecture of our time, although indirectly, but this fact cannot be denied. On the other hand, architecture has provided sources for abstract art. These two art forms have alternatingly influenced each other. There we are. The arts do have a common root even in our time. End of quote. Painting is close to the realm of architecture, particularly because architectural issues are so often, or I should say unavoidably, part of the subject matter of painting, regardless of whether we are looking at representational or abstract painting. In fact, this categorization is highly questionable altogether, as all meaningful art is bound to be representational in the existential sense. If a work of art does not evoke an existential encounter, it simply remains meaningless. And in some fundamental way, I would 
manner, I would argue that all artworks of all time uh, are a tautology. They always say the same thing. This is how it feels to be a human being in this world. That's what art artworks say. Late medieval and um, early Renaissance paintings are particularly inspiring for architects because of the constant presence of architecture. I cannot think of a more inspiring and illuminating lessons in architecture than early Renaissance paintings. If I could one day design a building with the tenderness uh, of Giotto's Fra Angelico's or Piero della Francesca's houses, I would have reached the very purpose of my life. The painter's interest in architecture seems to be related with the process of the differentiation of the world and, uh, uh, and the individual consciousness. The birth of the first personal pronoun, I. In these paintings, buildings are presented almost as human figures. The smallest of details suffices to create the experience of architectural space. A framed opening or a mere uh, edge of a wall uh, provide an architectural setting. The innocence and humanity of uh, this painterly architecture, the equality of the human and architectural figure is most comforting, touching, and inspiring. This is a truly therapeutic architecture. The, the best lessons in uh, domest domesticity and the essence of home are the 17th century Dutch paintings in which house interiors reflect a happy bourgeois lifestyle. The interaction between modern art and modern architecture are well known and acknowledged, but I have not yet seen an architecture which has been inspired by the painterly world of J.M.W. Turner, Claude Monet, or Mark Rothko, for instance. These inviting and enveloping spaces of color project a radiant vision of space, whereas Pierre Bonnard's paintings of bathing women express a delicate sensuality and hapticity which can surely teach a lesson to architects. I often show paintings like this to my students and say, if you achieve that kind of sensuality and tactility with the world, you have become a master architect. I want to argue that painting and other art forms have surveyed dimensions of human emotion and spirit untouched by architects, whose art tends to respond to rationalized normality and remain one-dimensional in its existential scope. The work of numerous art artists of our time is closely related with essential issues of architecture, such as Robert Smithson, Gordon Matta Clark, Mike, Michael Heiser, uh, Walter de Maria, Donald Judd, Robert Irving, uh, Janis Kunellis, Wolfgang Leib, and Hamilton, James Terrell, uh, and Agnes Martin, just to mention a few, all of whom also write perceptively of their own work. I feel obliged to say that artists tend to write more directly and sincerely of their work than architects who frequently cast an intellectualized smoke screen across their writings. Architecture of cinema. A number of notable architects of our time have explicitly acknowledged the importance of the cinematic world in their work. 
such as Jean Nouel, Bernard Chumi, Rem Kolhas, and Hani Rashid, for instance. This is what Jean Nouvel has to say about the interaction of architecture and cinema. Architecture exists, like cinema, in the dimension of time and movement. One conceives and reads a building in terms of sequences. To erect a building is to predict and seek effect of contrast and linkage through which one passes. In the continuous shot sequence that a building is, the architect works with cuts and edits, framing and opening. End of quote. In its inherent abstractness, music has historically been regarded as the art form which is closest to architecture. In my view, however, cinema is even closer to architecture than music, not solely because of its temporal and spatial structure, but fundamentally because both architecture and cinema articulate lived space. These two arts create and mediate comprehensive images of life. In the same way that buildings and cities create and preserve images of culture um, and particular ways of life, cinema projects the cultural ar archaeology of both the time of its making and the era that it depicts. Both forms of art define dimensions and essences of existential space. They both create experiential scenes for life situations. Film directors create pure poetic architecture. Should, which arises directly from our shared mental images of dwelling and domesticity as well as the eroticism and anxieties of space. Directors like Andrei Tarkovsky and Michelangelo Antonioni have created a moving architecture of memory, uh, longing and melancholy, which ass assures us that also the art of architecture is capable of addressing the entire human emotional range uh, ranging from grief to ecstasy. Jean Vigor's La Talente, Jean Renoir's The Rules of the Game, Orson Welles' Citizen Kane, and many other classics of cinema should be made compulsory ingredients of architectural education, in my view. In the end of my talk, I wish to turn back to books. As a young man and aspiring architect, I organized my books in two categories, architecture books and other books. Later on, I realized that all good books are books about architecture, in the essential sense that they depict the interaction of individuals with their settings, life histories, institutions and customs, as well as with other individuals. And this is exactly the life world in which architecture takes place. I realize that, that the essence of architecture is not in buildings as physical objects, but in their role as frames through which the world is seen and as horizons of experiencing and understanding the human condition. Buildings are mental instruments, not simply aestheticized shelters. The essence of architecture is essentially beyond architecture. Quote, let us assume a wall, what takes place behind the wall? The poet, French poet Jean Tardieu asks, but we architects rarely bother to imagine what happens behind the walls we have erected. Yet imagining life is more important than fantasizing spaces, as my mentor, Alice Bumstead, whom I mentioned earlier, taught me 45, 50 years ago. Somewhat later, I came to yet another realization. The books which I had categorized as non-architecture 
seem to reveal more important aspects of the human significance of, of architecture than the books written specifically about the art of building and architects. There is an obvious reason for this. Architecture books deal with the subject matter as a closed, formalized, and usually conventionalized discipline, whereas poetry, novels, and plays are engaged with the very mental ground from which architecture arises. This observation applies to all forms, art forms, painting, sculpture, photography, theater, dance, music, and cinema. They are all reveal the essence of artistic aspiration and expression, and they valorize the existential condition behind artistic expression. All arts are expressions of the timeless human existential enigma, and this gives Egyptian art, for instance, its voice by which it approaches us and has such a forceful impact across the abyss of four and a half millennia. The best lessons in architecture I have read are the following. Anton Chekhov's correspondence, which etches the essence of human character as well as the tragic and comic aspects of life in the reader's consciousness. He also teaches the supreme virtue of condensation and simplicity in artistic expression. Rainer Maria Rilke's poetry and his novel, The Notebook of Malte Lauritz Brigge, as well as his letters, all reveal the nature of poetic sensibility and the osmotic interaction between the outer space of the world and the inner space of the mind. Rilke teaches us the irreplaceable value of solitude and silence as conditions of sine qua non for creative work. Joseph Brodsky's essays, in which he analyzes in minute detail poems by Robert Frost, Frost Anna Akhmatova, and Osip Mandelstam, for instance, expose the incredible archaeology of poetic imagery. He also teaches us how the tragic vulgar and commonplace are ennobled as they become condensed into the spiritual imagery of poetry. Besides, he convinces the reader of the significance of uncertainty and insecurity for the creative mentality. Quote, poetry is a tremendous school of insecurity and uncertainty. Poetry, writing it as well as reading it, will teach you humility and rather quickly at that, especially if you are uh, both ri uh, writing and reading it. End of Brodsky quote. The poet's observation applies to architecture. It certainly humbles you, partic particularly if you are both making it and theorizing about it. In my personal case, the realm of uncertainty expands every day, and I have developed a great suspicion for individuals who are, who are sure of themselves and what they are talking about. In my view, uh, an arrogant and self-assured architect has not understood the meaning and depth of his trade, or even himself. I should add to my personal list of uh, most, significant, most, most significant architecture books, at least Franz Kafka's, Fyodor Dostoevsky's, Thomas Mann's, Hermann Hesse's, and Italo Calvino's novels. Calvino's The Invisible Cities is, of course, pure architecture in literary form, written architecture as it were. So are Jorge Luis Borges' short stories and Georges Perec's hilarious uh, Espes Despas. I would like to say that all good literature is about the condition of architecture. 
Some time ago I read Jorge Luis Borges' book entitled On Writing, in which he explains the origins and meanings of his literary imagery, for instance, of the horrifying short story entitled The End of the Duel, where two Argentinian gauchos who had been hostile to each other throughout their lives are both taken prisoner in a civil war and forced to perform their final rivalry in a running race with the throats cut. Borges reverses our received understanding of the relation of reality and imagination when he says, reality is not always probable or likely, but if you are writing a story, you have to make it as plausible as you can, because otherwise the reader's imagination will reject it. In architecture, likewise, not fantasy of spaces and forms, but genuine understanding of human behavior, experience, and imagination is needed. Borges also wisely warns us of the obsession with con contemporaneity. No real writer tried to be contemporary, he writes. The explicit desire to be novel and contemporary is equally disastrous in our craft. The aspiration to be sincere and authentic only produces meaningful novelty. I have spoken at some length of the value of literature to our understanding of architecture. Allow me to add one more observation. As we read a poem, we internalize it and we become the poem. poem. When I have read a book and returned it back to its place on the bookshelf, the book, in fact, remains in me. If it is a great book, it has become part of my soul and my body forever. The Czech writer Bohumil Hrabal gives a vivid description of the act of reading. Quote, when I read, I don't really read. I pop a beautiful sentence in my mouth and suck it like a fruit drop or a sip, sip it like a liqueur until the thought dissolves in me like alcohol, fusing my brain and heart and coursing on through the veins to the root of each blood vessel. In the same way, paintings, films, and buildings become part of us. Artistic works originate in the body of the maker, and they return back to the human body as they are being experienced. Architecture, as with all artistic work, is essentially the product of collaboration. It is not only collaboration in the obvious and practical sense of the word, such as the interaction of, with numerous professionals, workmen and, uh, and craftsmen, but it is a collaboration with other artists and architects, not only one's contemporaries and living, but with predecessors who have been dead for decades or centuries. One's most important teacher of architecture may well have died half a millennium ago. Any authentic work is set into the timeless tradition of artistic works, and the work is meaningful only if it presents itself humbly to this tradition and becomes part of that continuum. Countless architectural works made today are too ignorant, unrespectful, and arrogant to be accepted as constituents of the esteemed institutional tradition. The role of the dead in the collective of creative work, creative work, is, work was, of course, pointed out by T.S. Eliot in his seminal essay, Tradition and the Individual Talent of 1919 which ought to be one of the items in the long list of compulsory reading for all students of architecture. But instead of repeating 
this rather often quoted essay, I'll remind you of what Jean Genet has to say about the role of the dead in the creative teamwork in his essay on Alberto Giacometti. Quote, in its desire to acquire real significance, each work of art must descend the stairway of millennia with patience and extreme caution and meet, if possible, the immemorial night of the dead so that the dead recognize themselves in the work, end of quote. I often instruct my students to be careful and ambitious in, cho in choosing the private mentors. You can have Brunelleschi, Michelangelo, and Louis Kahn, for instance, uh, as your mentor if you are wise and courageous enough to appoint them as your personal mentors in the search for the secrets of architecture. Many of the finest artists of our time have mentioned Piero della Francesca as their most important teacher. My good friend, the legendary Finnish designer Tapio Virkala, often said to me that Piero was his teacher. Yet Piero died in 1492 and Tapio, my friend, was born in 1915. The artistic tradition is not a depository, however, from which to borrow, quote, or steal without permission. It is an esteemed community of its own, a community of conversation, exchange, and mutual uh, assessment and respect. We do not only utilize the accumulated wisdom of architecture. Milan Kundera speaks of the wisdom of novel and argues that all good writers consult this wisdom. We also alter the reading of prior works. This reverse process of historical influence is most often forgotten. But it calls for special sensitivity and responsibility. Aldo van Eyck, one of the seminal architects of the second half of the 20th, 20th century, who uh, taught us the human meaning of geometry and showed the importance of anthropological studies for architecture, once was asked to give a lecture. Actually, his uh, um, uh, first lecture when he was made professor at University of Tel Delft on uh, uh, Giotto's influence on Cezanne. Instead of uh, giving this lecture, lecture, he gave a lecture on Cezanne's influence on Giotto, because he, he felt that that's much more important. And I think this is a real stroke of genius, because that is the way uh, new art uh, always changes the past. And we see all works uh, through the eyes of uh, our own gifted contemporaries. He realized that the thinking and painting of Paul Cezanne made us all see Giotto's work in a totally new context. I am mentioning this reverse interaction in order to emphasize the multidirectional and dimensional nature of creative work. Creative works draw from and advance to all possible directions simultaneously, and new works keep constantly altering and revising our reading of history. History is not written as a progressive linear process, but backwards as a repeated cyclical process. Beauty is an inseparable part of the notion of art, but it has a complex nature. Joseph Brodsky even dares to criticize Ezra Pound for this tendency to aim directly at beauty. He writes the Cantos, which is the famous uh, collection of Ezra Pound. The Cantos too left me cold. The main error was the old one, questing after beauty. It was odd that he hadn't realized that beauty can't be targeted that it is always a byproduct of other 
often very ordinary pursuits. In our craft also, seductive beauty and aesthetic appeal have regrettably become a conscious and explicit aim. At the same time, architecture has lost its sight of its social aspirations, the notions of equality and emancipation, which inspired early modernity. Instead of aspiring for a better and more humane world future, contemporary architecture seems to be blinded by momentary attention and celebrity. Well, I'll end right here. I will gladly answer any questions that you might have. No questions. <laughs> By the way, I will give a few of my books to the to the library, um, so you can find quite a number of my as essays in, in those books uh, after tomorrow, I, if I remember to take them from my hotel room. Uh, yes, please. Now, I saw, I spoke, I saw uh, good uh, architecture in love uh, from Pedro. Pardon? Architecture in love. Yes. From Pedro. What's that book? Uh, no, no, I didn't show it. No. Yes, yes. Well, he wrote uh, quite a number of uh, rather surprising poetic, poetic books. Uh, I don't know whether he, uh, you remember John Hayden, who was a giant as a, as a man like, like this tall, but uh, had a child's, uh, child's imagination personality completely here. When we met the first time in 1978 in Helsinki, uh, he sent me a book after our meeting, and the book was on angels. Surprising gift book from an architect to another architect. <coughs> yes, please. Um, can you express something uh, similar uh, uh, of uh, architecture of Stephen Paul uh, in his uh, museum gallery that he did uh, finish thinking of, uh, of how to make uh, 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 place as he made them. One of the first architects, architects who came across well, Stephen has been a very close friend of mine. Uh, we were friends already before he asked me to be the local architect uh, in uh, uh, realizing the Kiasma Museum. In fact, Kenneth Frampton and I were his advisors uh, in the competition phase, and three, day, three days before the competition closed, he sent me his propo uh, proposal to buy um, fax to Yale, uh, where I was teaching, and I, I told him, uh, you will not have a chance with this um, project. And within the last three days, he's changed his uh, project completely and won, won the first prize. Uh, uh, well, so I, I know Stephen's thinking quite well, and I have written several essays on, on his work. The la uh, last essay is on, on his uh, Knut Hamsun Museum in, in Norway. Knut Hamsun was a Norwegian, Norwegian uh, Nobel Prize winning writer who uh, had uh, 
Nazi sympathies to the point of uh, visiting Hitler once. So he has been a very uh, controversial and taboo subject uh, in Norway. And uh, Stephen de uh, designed the museum for Knut Hamsun, which I think is uh, a brilliant work because it expresses exactly this troubled personality. So for me, Stephen is one of the architects today that um, combines a phenomenological philosophical thinking and uh, uh, in his architecture. Uh, we uh, wrote a book uh, entitled uh, Questions of Perception with uh, Alberto Perez Gomez uh, early on in, in the early 90s, 93 I think. Uh, and uh, we are still friends and continue along the same, same lines. My book, The Eyes of the Skin, which has uh, uh, sold around the world and is being read in almost all architecture schools, actually comes from the essay I wrote for that, that book. So I can say only positive things about Stephen, Stephen Hall. Perhaps he has fallen a bit uh, bit uh, victim to the uh, problem of today. Popularity kills any any talent. So you you should be careful about success because success easily spoils the, the best talent. Being unsuccessful is much better position for a creative person. Yes. Yes. Yes, well, not only information, also experiences. They, as uh, Rilke says, they have to turn into your blood circulation. Uh, anything that or, or that is useful in creative work has to be part of you, part of your entire be being. You, you cannot uh, uh, use, uh, you know, things that are out, outside or beyond beyond you. I'm very very certain of that, uh, and that is why, at least for me, it is uh, always more important uh, to look at. Uh, paintings, for instance, when I start a new design work, uh, because paintings inspire you in a uh, more abstract manner, uh, whereas if I were looking at uh, buildings, masterful buildings, there would be a, a, a temptation to somehow follow those ideas. So I, I would suggest uh, look, look at paintings or look at Find films uh, or read good, good poetry to to build up a sense of inspiration. Pardon me? I think I think it's an important part of the world. Well, I. I don't know if you understand my question. No, no. We can't. Sorry? You must also understand boring information before they use all that in order to forget them with Well, yes, that's true, but but information it's itself is is not very useful. It's useful in developing, you know, practical ideas, but uh, they are not uh, part of the poetic essence of things. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, absolutely. Yes, but uh, without the poetic sensibility, architecture becomes, uh, you know, something else. And uh, that is why I'm uh, quite uh, opposed to the idea that uh, a, a, of a, a totally professionalist uh, education where education aims directly at, uh, you know, professional practice. 
Pardon me? Yes. 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 Well, I would just say that, of course, a responsible architect or, or a responsible medical doctor or lawyer or anyone takes care of the facts of uh, his work and decision making, but uh, the poetic content doesn't arise from the facts. It is a product of something else. Pardon me? From all the books that you mentioned, the mental is a great book. Which book would you say that stands out for the group, that is most brilliant, that you would like to reread again, that is that it's been so influenced for you, for your mind, to present your word? I often go back to Rilke's little book, uh, Letters to a Young Poet. I think it is a wonderful uh, book. Uh, it is so generous uh, that uh, a genius uh, of poetry uh, wants uh, genuinely to help a young man who wants to become a poet. And uh, the advice he gives, uh, mind you, Rilke is 27 years old only when he writes these letters. This, the advice he gives to the young man are just touching advice and uh, which any one of us could, could use at a young age. And perhaps even my age. I'm sorry, that somehow the acoustics uh, doesn't work this way. Yeah. Well, I always have uh, one building in my mind, and that's Michelangelo's uh, Biblioteca Laurentiana, the, the stairway, because it is the most powerfully emotional piece of architecture I have ever seen. Uh, so there are certain certain uh, buildings, there are certain paintings, there are certain poems to which I always return. When I travel around the world, I go to repeatedly to the same museums to look at the same same paintings. It is so refreshing to see a Vermeer painting, for instance, again and again, and every time be, be uh, you know, uh, confirmed that this is a true masterpiece. This is human purity of soul at its, at its finest. You don't need to have many, many works of art that uh, make your life meaningful. Well, shall we call it the evening and go and have a beer or a glass of wine? <coughs> Thank you.